when we work with leaders, uh, whether it's new managers or senior executives or it's employees in every organization, when we start to work with them on their development as whole leaders and whole people on the job, almost every time, I almost would maybe say every time, family and friends comes up as a part of that picture. It just it just happens every single time. And uh, so I have a question for you. When I ask you, who do you consider family and who do you consider friends? Who comes to mind? Um, and I know that as you think about that, there is a longer story. Um, and so at the, at the risk of being a little bit too transparent about my own answer, uh, and in hopes that you might think about your own as I, let me tell you about my friends and family. Um, for me, when I consider my family, here's a little context. I have been married to my wife, Jackie, for 26 years. Um, it's that it's that number of years where you're not sure that number's right anymore. You know what I'm talking Some of you are laughing. Yeah, that's good. Um, and we have two sons, Aiden and Ryan, who are 20 and 21. Um, Jackie has one sister, and I'm uh, pretty close to my brother-in-law, so my wife's brother-in-law. So we have just, we are good friends. They have two children and their family. I'm the youngest of three siblings who are all still living. And both my parents are living and in their 90s. Um, I am the youngest by eight years, meaning I like to have, I, I likely have both youngest and oldest characteristics um, and to the extent that birth order plays a role. So I'm not going to over pivot to that. Some of you are like putting me in a box right now. Um, I was raised by a pack of what I describe as she wolves, um, two sisters and a mother who are very strong and very benevolent um, and who will attack anyone who threatens the, uh, the pack. Um, but because of the benevolence, we'll more likely love you into submission and not tackle you. Um, and so that's just kind of the, the kind of women that I was raised by. I have, and I really was like, I grew up with sisters who just were rocking me to sleep. For some reason, my mom made my sister, like sometimes if I was getting scared, I'm going and climbing into bed with my sister who's eight years older. And we're still good friends to this day for some reason, even though that happened. Um, I have known my sibling spouses most of my life. So I do not know life without them in it. I have lots of nieces and nephews and their kids who are my family. Um, and my immediate family, my siblings, spouses, and their kids have spent the last 55 years. This is a weird thing about my family going to the same weird little hotel resort in Eastern Washington um, that has given us deeper relationships to one another without that time together once a week that we have paid the price for because we get a lot of rooms because we could never live in a house together for a week. Um, is is actually created relationships between, for example, my sons and their old, much older cousins that um, would not exist, I don't think, without that. Um, and I think that I would tell you this is that we are all a little weird in our own ways. There are difficulties in my family, um, but I think to maybe compared to many families, we've been decent at working things out. Um, we also raised, when it comes to friends, we raised our children with a cadre of other, of five, four other families. Um, and in fact, just did a ceremony last week where we graduated two more of them uh, from high school or are heading out to the next part of their lives. Um, and I would say that my closest friends, because of the way my parents are, are kind of swallowed up in my family category. So many of, there are, there are actually a couple of you here who uh, have been claimed by my parents. And so there's a sense in which I thought about this. I thought some of the, the friends that I have, um, I would define as part of that circle of family. Um, I would say this about my friends. My closest friends are those with whom I can be some part of myself most naturally. Some part of myself most naturally. Typically, our relationship to each, to each other evolves around a common interest. I mean, it's just maybe this is just a me thing, but whether it's fishing, skiing, mountain biking, call of duty, yes. Call of Duty, or just shared history, uh, we can't escape. My closest friend are either those with whom I do life on a daily basis or those I could call after six months and we would not miss a beat um, when I'm honest about that. Um, I do say that my I think my closest friends have a pretty good handle on taking responsibility for themselves for the most part, um, and I can hold conversations in solidarity with them. Um, and I will tell you this, if you know me better, they put up with a lot of juvenile kind of behavior from, from old Dr. McKenna. Cause I have, I'm like, I run on two gears, like super deep and then super just, I'm 15 years old again. So, um, they put up with that in me. 
They're far from perfect, my family and friends, but they are people with whom I work. I I will work it out over the long haul. Um, and I know as I bring this up, even as we talk about this, um, I'm really excited about this. And I also felt a weight because I thought, you know, I know there's some people who are in a season where there's a lot of brokenness around this. Um, and a lot of things that are, that are continuing to get worked out. And I'm telling you, if, if what I just described you, I just gave you this surface, right? Please know that, um, like you, there are places where there is nuance in this. There are individual relationships that are, you know, that sometimes they move through seasons of struggle. Um, and so I, I hope you know that I see you and not only that, but I probably relate to you far more than you may expect. And as my wife and her friends say, friends are like vacuum attachments. Different friends serve different roles in your life. Um, and family on their hand, for me, feels more like an old school vacuum cleaner that didn't have attachments. It's kind of what you have. You love it, but you got to work with it the way it is. Um, I know that's oversimplified, but I think it's kind of funny for me to think about. Um, and I would say that at this point in my life, for me, intention with regard to family and friends is rooted in a deeper, this is for me personally, in a deeper question regarding time and purpose. Where will I spend my time at this point in my life and for what purpose is a big part of that. So when I ask you to consider who your friends and family are, who comes to mind for you? What is the context that comes up that's important? Because we're going to get more into that. All right, here we go. I'm Dr. Rob McKenna. That was all just intro. And welcome to the Wild Conversation, uh, where we make the best thinking in psychology, leadership, and organizational science accessible to leaders who are willing to learn and edit for their sake and for the sake of others. And uh, right now we're launching this new series, Living Your Intentional Life. And today we're taking, we're talking specifically about family and friends. And we're going to cover a lot of ground in the next couple of weeks as we get into these different pieces of what our whole lives look like and what it means to be intentional in those spaces. And it is going to be new content, things that maybe we haven't talked about. For those of you who have been to the wild conversation for a while, we're going to get into health and we're going to get into work. We're going to get into faith. We're going to get into career. We're going to get into finances. We're going to get into all of it. Um, and today we're starting with family and friends and there are a thousand pathways we could cover in our time together, um, about friends and family, a thousand, like I could, I could think of a thousand and maybe not a thousand, maybe two dozen. Um, and know that as I talk through this, I'm fully aware that there, um, are amazing things about your friends and family, but that all of our stories have challenge, redemption, um, uh, depth, um, and brokenness as we always say, but also an aspiration for more or at least an aspiration for some intention. Um, and at this point in my life, and given the wealth of research I've seen, I can make this promise to you, I think, at this point in my life. What does that mean to make a promise? Because at this point in my life, am I qualifying that? Um, your friends and family and your perspective on who that is and who it could be is impacting your leadership every single day. Um, and even if it's not, <laughs> more integration of your thinking might help. So here's here's a big question I want to throw out there is, um, would you rather be happy or whole? Yeah, there it is again. Would you rather be happy or whole? Um, and I know that my, that question forces a choice that you may not like making, <laughs> but it might be important to entertain for just a moment and not fight it. And here's my point as we set this up is happiness is a good thing. And we talked about this last week. Um, but it often can feel a bit like it's all about feeling good or that it might have a pretty short shelf life. And I think one of the possible realities is that we want both, but wholeness is more, isn't it? Isn't wholeness more? Uh, it's like it's it's like it almost swallows up happiness as part of itself. Imagine feeling more whole and more whole with regard to family and friends. And if we allowed ourselves to sit in that for a moment and 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 rest into the aspirational pillow that is wholeness, for me, that feels much deeper than happiness alone, because it's not, it's not just about, it's not, it's not about a feeling alone, but a, but a place or a space or a person in which I abide. And, and wholeness, it sounds like a big word, but it's, it's not, it's, it is an academic. It's not just an existential thing. It's something we know we want when we give ourselves just a moment to consider the possibility and its impact. And it demands that we take the variables of our lives. We begin to work the work of integration, 
that we give up the masquerade of boundaries between our lives and all the work we've done to disintegrate things and begin to bring them together. It's not always easy, but I think it's important. And a movement toward our aspiration of wholeness is possible with just a dose of intentionality, a simple dose of intentionality. And when I say intentionality, I mean choices, rhythms, conversations, awareness of yourself, awareness of others. And those things impact so many things. Um, And so why family and friends? Like, why, why this? Our work developing leaders across every organizational context imaginable has made it clear that the most important relationships beyond our work impact how we function. Um, if you're do, if you're going to do whole and intentional leader development, you simply cannot separate family and friends. You can't say like it was whole, and we didn't talk about this. <laughs> it just doesn't feel right. It doesn't. I mean, we know that's true. It can't be separated from our work. And sure, we can compartmentalize in seasons, but the real sto- real story is that fulfillment in one area impacts the others. And I want to use just I want to use marriage just for a second. And with full sensitivity to those who aren't married, who were married, but let me, if you were, then you know what I'm talking about too. But let me use marriage as an example, as one part of the family category. And I'm going to let a cat out of the bag. I think maybe I've already done this, but this year we'll be doing a session with a large group of leaders and their spouses uh, called Wild Marriages. Uh, Yeah, we are going to do a bit of wild work on marriages. And why is wild leaders going there with leaders? Our work developing leaders across every org, every context I, ma- ma- I mentioned has made it clear that the most important relationships beyond our work impact how we function. So having worked with many couples who co-own businesses has made it a no-brainer for us to use the infrastructure and psychological principles and awareness in the wild toolkit in the marriages of leaders. And while we don't complain to be experts, we know that these leaders in marriage are impacted by their marriage health and intentionality and vice versa. So that's it's just a it's one of the, as, as an example of that, but let me give you to go a little deeper into just the marriage part of our family relationships. Anyone who is married, typically, I would say, I think I could say this, knows that our relationship to our spouses are oftentimes very nuanced and unique. It's one of the reasons that many five steps to a lasting marriage books, those books often leave us wanting more. General principles are helpful, but can leave us wishing they had written just one more chapter that would have described our marriage specifically. And as soon as we get married, there's an interesting tie between marriage and these close relationships in our lives. You know, you don't have to be married to think about this and leadership because we realize that one of the greatest challenges is understanding what it means to lead together, to see one another, to uh, to get intentional. We're no longer purposeful alone. We're not called alone. We're not learning alone and we're not leading alone. We do this together and we cannot develop as whole leaders across the boundaries of our lives and work without an intentional investment in the most important relationships in our lives and understanding those things a little bit better. And maybe maybe understanding even when to leave certain things behind, you know, is like in certain relationships that may come back. Um, And so the same is true, not just when I just use marriage as an example, but the same is true of the rest of our family and friendships outside of work. So what I, I want to do is just is give you five principles for each of us regarding getting intentional about our family and our friendships. All right. So here's here are, here are five principles. One is this: that intentionality is a choice and not a compulsion. Intentionality regarding your friends and family is a choice and not a compulsion. It's a chosen rhythm and not a compulsive habit. It's a choice based on the most complete awareness of all the variables in play as possible. A choice, not a compulsion. It's a chosen rhythm that is based, that is not based on a compulsion or on entitlement or on reactivity. It is a choice made with the best intentions for ourselves and for others. Um, and I think one of the things with friends and family, for some of you, it's quite simply maybe recognizing that maybe you have some choices to make that you didn't think you did. Number two. I hope you feel invited by that, by the way, and not a condemnation for not having made a choice in the past because I'm just, I got a lot of fingers pointing back at me as I as I tell you that. So, number 2, see friends and family as long haul as a as a long haul proposition. Family and friends as some of the most important relationships of our lives move in seasons and stages. I just that has been a huge one of my friends said this even in the early parts of my marriage when my wife and I a lot of people go through that 7 year sort of challenge or something about 7 years into a marriage, you know, and and my one of my best friends he said, "Rob, it, 
it's seasons. And you know how much that mindset affected me? It was just unbelievable. And I think the same is true with friendships. Uh, number three, readiness requires readiness. We cannot expect our friends and family to change in ways we are not willing to change. It just, it's, it's, um, it's a simple principle, I think. But And then number four, you do you or live your truth isn't enough. I know this puts me counter to some of the, the messages that are out there, especially for young people. But I think most of us know that the idea that our only job is to understand who we are is idealized and utopian and a nice idea, but isn't enough to live in healthy relationships. Healthy relationships to others always involve contradictions, disagreements, and working it out together in a spirit of grace and love and truth. And I think being yourself and understanding yourself is a huge part of it. But we all know that as leaders, like, that's not enough. Now I'm responsible for understanding how you see yourself. And then we work it out together. You know, it's like, it's so that's what's kind of awesome about relationships. Number five, loneliness is a state and not a trait. Loneliness is a state and not a trait. Um, Most of us probably aren't as alone as we think. But even if we are, a little courage can go a long way to put yourself out there. And I would say this as I'm looking at, as I see your faces and I know many of you, you came to the wild conversation today. So you just did put yourself out there. Um, and then number six in relationship, this is a big one. Uh, avoid personality boxes. People change. Do we believe it? You know what I mean? So avoid putting people in boxes that they they actually do not belong in. And it, it personality gives us insight. Those traits and things about us that don't change give us insight, but it is only part of the story. Um, number seven work. I guess I had more than I thought you all. I thought I had five. I've got a seven work is an important contributor. I think what's fascinating our work with leaders is that how we function at work can help you understand how you, how to function better at home. There's a really interesting conversation that occurs in that space between work and family and understanding how the structures of our lives impact different things. And then the last thing is that number, number eight is getting intentional begins with assessment of where we are. And then moving on to an understanding of the variables in play. So I just want to, as we, as we launch out into, we begin to think about to continue this conversation, I want you to do something right now. I'd love for you to write down these two words on a piece of paper, if you have it, or wherever you take notes, family, and then put a little space between it and friends, family, and then friends. And underneath each of those words. I'd love for you to rate your fulfillment level level on a scale from one to 10 on each of those things, family and friends. A one being like, I got a lot of work to do regarding fulfillment in that area of my life. A 10 being, it could not be more dialed in right now. And I, I'd love for, no one's looking over your shoulder unless someone is. <laughs> I don't know where everybody is, but let's assume that um, most of you probably are not. So be honest. Like, where do you feel right now? This is not an, this is not an assessment or a test. It's just giving you a moment to assess. And what I would love for us to think about together as a community of leaders and people trying to understand all of this in relationship to our own leadership and the leadership of other people is to examine the variables that are feeding that score. Two or three things that might be, that might be affecting that are your, that's your nuance that might be affecting your perceptions of that level of fulfillment at this point. And I'll tell you this, and in our work with leaders, this sounds like we're not getting to the solution. And I'm telling you, yeah, we're not. Well, we are. Because part of the solution is take having the courage to assess and say, where are you, where are you right now in your own story regarding family and friends? And then the next part, maybe in this conversation, would be to have the courage to say, and this is one of those variables I want to figure out. This is one of those variables I want to figure out related to family or friends. And for you to take the conversation where you believe it's most necessary for you to get intentional in this part of your life. And so I just, let's, let's keep the conversation going.